Good afternoon and welcome to the third of North Coast Local Land Services webinar series. Um, my name is Julie Dart and I'll be your host for today. Um, firstly, uh, welcome to today's web webinar. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country in which our North Coast region is part of. This includes Bunjalung, Yagel, Gitable, Gumbangi, Dungadi and Biripai Nations. I pay respect to those elders, past, present and future, and welcome any, any other Indigenous people here today and all of you here today. I would like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is um, Dr Luke Shelley, who is the General Manager of the Australian Bureau of Meteorology's Agriculture Program. So after that, what will happen, we'll, we'll have um, Luke's colleague, Alistair Hawkstead, who also is one of the general managers of the agriculture program at the BOM. He will um, be available to answer your questions at the end of the, the slide presentations. So without further ado, I would um, like you to tune in and we'll listen to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, my name's Luke Shelley. I'm from the Bureau of Meteorology. And today we'll be talking about the July to September outlook for the North Coast region. First. Just a little bit of background on the Bureau. Um, I'm sure that you're all really uh, aware of the, um, that we provide forecasts and warnings, historical information. But the reason that we do all of those things is to really to benefit the Australian community and to drive competitive advantage for businesses and industries. And we're a federally funded agency. And so ultimately, we're seeking to create value and impact. You can get a copy of the Bureau strategy online, if you like. That's available publicly. But the sort of uh, information that we work in really goes from all the way back in the past. And in some cases, uh, like I'll show you today, we've got records that go back almost 100 years or more in some parts of Australia. Um, and then looking at at uh, what's been happening more recently and even up to the minute with some of our weather observations. And then our forecast products that go out days, weeks, uh, months, all the way out to climate projections into the future for uh, decades ahead. Um, so we work, work across a really broad range of time scales. I want to take you through a couple of those time steps today for the North Coast New South Wales region. So I'm going to start by talking about the July to September outlook. And then I'll talk a little bit about how to interpret our forecast products. And we'll finish the, the last part of the presentation talking about the climate of the North Coast region and how we can use some of that information to tell us what's happening around us and what might be happening in the future. So now into the July to September outlook. This is the national outlook for July to September. This is what we call a climate outlook. And it's based on a model that tells us the chance of rainfall occurring relative to our average rainfall for this time of the year. So anywhere that you see on the map a brownie colored area, that's indicating that there's a reduced chance of that area receiving its average rainfall over the next three months from July to September. Anywhere you see that bluey green color, that's telling us that there's an increased chance of receiving average or greater than the average rainfall for the next three months period. It doesn't tell us exactly how much though rainfall we might get in that period. And the other thing to keep in mind here is that if there's an increased chance of getting wetter than average, there's still a chance of getting drier than average. So if an area, for example, that shows the light green color, which is 60 to 65 percent chance of receiving greater than average rainfall, it still means that there's a 35 percent chance that the, the rainfall could be lower than average. Just looking at a little bit more detail for the North Coast region, so I've got the two outlooks there. We've got the outlook for the month ahead of us for July, and then the outlook for July to September. For the North Coast region, there is an increased chance of wetter than average rainfall for July, only slightly increased for July period. And you can see that further west of, of your region, uh, it's actually uh, an increased chance of dry. Um, that's related to uh, 
some of the things that are happening around us in the atmosphere at the moment, uh, they're, cr they're causing um, drier than average conditions across most of eastern Australia. And then we're looking, looking ahead into uh, the start of spring, um, July to September, and the outlook's telling us that there's an increased chance of wetter than average conditions. But there is a way to find out further information than just looking at the above or below average maps. And I highly recommend that people use the Bureau's website to just dig down and find a little bit more information about their area. And I'm going to show you some of that now. This is the Bureau's Climate Outlooks portal. So based on what I just showed you with the map, that's actually in this portal. And there's probabilistic forecasts for the next week, next month, and next three months. When I say probabilistic forecast, it means that it's not telling you an exact total of rainfall that's going to occur. It's talking more about the chance of different amounts of rainfall occurring. You can also look at the maximum temperature and minimum temperature outlooks on that portal as well. There's also a really handy monthly climate and water outlook video. And you can click on that, and that's on our YouTube channel, and that has some of our top scientists talking about what's happening around the country and what might be driving our climate at the time. You can go onto the portal and you can actually type in the name of your location and it'll pop up a little graph. And you can just see, it's a, bit, a little bit hard to see, but just in, in the, in the uh, screenshot I've got there, I've just got a, a, a pop-up for Grafton. And there's a little chart there, a bar chart, which actually shows different amounts of rainfall. And I'm going to show you a little bit more detail about that now. So those charts, and this is what I talk about when I say drill down to a little bit more detail about the outlook. But remember before I said that for July to September, there's an increased chance of wetter than average conditions through that three month period. And this is what the distribution or the chance of that rainfall looks like. This comes from our seasonal outlook computer model that runs every week to tell us this information. So what I've, what I've actually plotted here, and this is exactly the information that's available on the website. I've got Grafton, Casino, Kempsey, and Dorigo. And just having a look here, uh, in the red, um, you can see what the average rainfall for that period is for each location. And the charts just show uh, varying amounts of rainfall and what the chance of getting those is. So if we look at Grafton, we can see there's a really high chance of getting 50 millimetres for that three month period, the actual average at this time of year for July to September is 77 millimetres. And there's actually, if you have a look at it, an increased chance of getting a little bit more than that, 100 millimetres. But then you can see the chart drops right down, so a much lower chance of getting something like 150 millimetres or above. You can see the same pattern across Casino, Kempsey and Dorigo. So again, just to take another example, you can see that Dorigo has a really high chance of getting 50 millimetres in the next three months. Uh, a pretty high chance of getting 100 mil as well. In fact, the average at this time of the year is 114 millimetres. And there's an increased chance of getting 150 millimetres or more as well. Uh, and then it starts to drop away. So there's a less than 50% chance of getting 200 mil, 250 and, and so on. That's a really useful way about understanding exactly what amount of rainfall you might get. But remember again, this isn't telling you exactly what you're going to get. It's just telling you what the chance is. So if you were telling me that you really needed 200 mil in casino over the next three months to help with your pasture growth, I'd be telling you that there's a really low chance that that's going to happen. And you might need to think about what your management actions would be around that. Moving on to interpreting weather forecasts, so I just talked to you then about the climate forecasts, and the climate forecasts actually use a different model, and I said that the outputs from those were probabilistic. So it's really scenario based. A really common question that we get at the Bureau is how we do our forecasting, and people often think that we forecast based on the nearest weather station. And as I'm sure you're aware, weather stations can be tens if not hundreds of kilometres away from where you are. The process that we use to create forecasts is actually called a forecast grid. And the forecast grid is a computer algorithm that takes the input from all of the weather stations around the country and then creates the gridded output, which is a forecast for every six kilometres. 
So yes, the forecast is based on the nearest weather station, but it's also based on all of the other weather stations around it. And what that allows us to do is provide a forecast for anywhere in Australia, and it's a unique forecast for that area that's not determined whether or not you have a weather station near your property. This is a computer output from our model, so it's a different model that we use to the climate outlooks. This time, the model can actually tell you how much rain you can expect and the chance of getting that rain. I'm showing you here what you probably commonly see how we communicate our rainfall forecast. You can see that there's a bit of information there with the temperature, and then below that, there's two lines. One says possible rainfall, two to six millimeters. And the other one says chance of any rain, 90%. Those are two separate pieces of information that are not related to each other. I frequently hear people say that they think that that means there's a 90% chance of getting two to six millimetres. And unfortunately, that's not correct. Let's just start with the second line, which says chance of any rain, 90%. What that actually means is the chance that a Bureau weather station will record any rain. And the minimum amount of rain that a Bureau weather station can record is 0 0.2 millimetres. So that statement actually means that there's a 90% chance of getting 0.2 millimetres or more. And that's not a lot of rainfall, but it is a high chance. It's important not to confuse that number with the other line there, which says possible rainfall. The possible rainfall actually represents the range that there's a 50% chance to a 25% chance of receiving. So the first number, two millimetres, represents the 50% chance of getting that amount of rainfall. That's a flip of a coin, all right? So heads, tails, you could get two millimetres. The, sec the second uh, number, six millimetres, refers to the 25% chance, or one in four chance that you would get that amount of rainfall. And that's a much lower chance. And they're both much lower chances than the 90% chance of rain. So it's really important to keep those two, separate, those two pieces of information separate so that you can actually assess the chance that you will receive, uh, well, how much rainfall you might actually receive. Just like with our climate outlooks, we've got another portal which is dedicated to the weather forecast, and it's called METI. METI is our graphical viewer for every one of those forecasts that I said that we can do around the country. It's for the next seven days, and you can get daily outputs, and you can also get in, uh, in the first couple of days, you can get three hourly outputs. And it contains a whole range of weather variables, rainfall, temperature, wind, frost, and, and quite a few others as well. It's the Bureau's official forecast. Just like on the Climate Outlook poll, you can also type in your location, and you can find out a little bit more detail. So you give, I've typed in here as an example, Kempsey, and you get a little pop-up showing the rainfall and the temperature for the week. If you click on the top right though, you can see um, where I've highlighted in red, it says see text views for location. And I highly recommend people use that information that's on, on that link and I'll show you what it looks like now. So this is what we call the text views. And these are really handy pages to bookmark for your local um, area. You can also, by the way, type in a GPS coordinate if you want to get the forecast for your exact property. Just remember though, um, the forecasts are based on that six kilometre grid. So within a six kilometre area, the forecast won't vary, but beyond that, uh, they're certainly different for every grid point. On the left, I'm showing you the daily overview, and that's where you can see the three hourly breakdown for rainfall, the possible rainfall amount and the chance of rain in each of those three hour periods. You can also see the latest observations for your area on the far left and there's a link down the bottom right to the radar. Where the more detailed information is kept is in our three hourly forecast. And it's really handy to open that up and have a look. And you've got a whole range of things, rainfall, temperature, UV, significant weather like thunderstorm, snow, fog and frost, humidity and wind as well. And where I showed you earlier the, the two rainfall pieces of information, you can actually now start to see that in the top table for rainfall. So there's the 50% chance of what you might receive in that three hour period. 
there's a 25% chance. And there's actually another category called the 10% chance, and that can act be a really good way of understanding if there might be any extreme amounts of rainfall that don't happen very often, but can happen. So that's how you can get more detailed information for your area. And again, I highly recommend you look at that. It's got much more rich information than what you get just on the Bureau's app or by looking at the, the standard district forecast. Now I'd like to talk about the climate of the North Coast region. And I'll introduce you to a project that the Bureau completed just in the last 12 months. We ran a project called the Climate Guides. Um, the idea of a climate guide is to give a snapshot of a region's climate from 1959 to 2018. And we've compared two 30-year periods, uh, 1959 to 1988 and 1989 to 2018, in that guide. There's a range of topics that are relevant to agriculture. And each of them are based on NRM regions or LLS regions. So there's a guide, a climate guide, for every LLS region in New South Wales and every NRM region around the country, of which there are 56. Um, I, I'll actually be attaching uh, the climate guide to the presentation to the webinar today so that you can download it. What I'm going to do now though is go through what some of the contents are in that guide. One of the things that we present in the climate guide is the annual rainfall. And you can see here I've plotted some charts for Grafton, Casino, Kempsey and Dorigo. Probably the first thing you notice is that not every one of those rainfall stations has actually had a record that goes back more than 50 years. So uh, Grafton and Dorigo only go back a few decades, uh, at least Grafton into the 60s. Uh, Casino and Kempsey have got records that go well before the 1900s. There hasn't been much of a decrease, only a slight decrease in annual rainfall in the last 30 years in the North Coast LLS region. We're talking about 5 to 7% across the region. Certainly the annual rainfall fluctuates from year to year and you can see that by the graph. But the dark blue line that's uh, across the top of the graph is actually our five year running average. And whilst it dips and uh, curves up and down a bit throughout the, the period, um, it actually hasn't changed significantly. So there's no significant trend there. That's good news for this region. Um, certainly other parts of Australia have shown more significant declines in rainfall over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, so really the rainfall in, in the North Coast um, is relatively stable or hasn't changed much in the last 60 years. But within those last 60 years, there's been a little bit of a different pattern in how many wet years versus how many dry years have occurred. Wet years are what we consider to be in the top 30% of rainfall records. And conversely, dry years are what we consider to be in the bottom 30% of rainfall records. Comparing the period 1959 to 1988 and 1989 to 2018, so both 30 year periods, in the first period, in the earlier period of the 60s, 70s and 80s, there were 11 wet years, 12 average years and 7 dry years. In the more recent 30 year period, there were the same amount of wet years, but there was actually a decrease in the number of average years and an increase in the number of dry years. You need to keep in mind, of course, that the millennium drought occurred during that period and that absolutely would have had an impact on that number. Uh, these this information also doesn't include the last couple of years. We've also had a significant drought across the country. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see what this looks like again, perhaps in another five to 10 years and whether or not that pattern's increasing. But it does give you an overall picture of what might have been happening in the last 30 to 60 years. Of course, the other aspect to rainfall is not just whether or not the amount of wet and dry years are, are changing or indeed the average rainfall, but more importantly, when that rain actually falls. So these charts here show a breakdown of the last two 30 year periods, again, 1959 to 1988, which is the blue bars, and 1989 to 2018, which is the orange bars. Anywhere that the blue bar is higher than the orange bar, for the given month, and I should say that the month 
is at the bottom of the chart and the amount of rainfall is going up the side of the chart. So anywhere the blue bar is higher than the orange bar means that the previous 30 year period across the 60s, 70s and 80s had a higher average rainfall for that month than the most recent period. And the flip side being that anywhere the orange bar is higher, uh, it means that the most recent 30 year period had a higher average monthly rainfall than the previous. There's no really big changes here. Certainly you can see a couple of things uh, happening perhaps in October at Kempsey where the, uh, the last uh, 30 years has been a bit on average, a little bit drier uh, than the previous 30 years and maybe at January as well. They're not talking about huge amounts of rainfall here. So overall uh, we would consider that this represents fairly stable rainfall patterns across, across the region um, and across all 12 months of the year. Of course there's some other things that are changing around us as well and uh, that's one of those is the extreme cool temperature or what we call frost potential. Frost potential it represents the potential for frost to occur. It doesn't actually mean that a frost did occur. The way we calculate frost potential is our weather stations are about 1.5 to 2 metres off the ground and when they record zero at that distance up above the ground it act normally equates to about minus 2 at the ground level. So what we've done here is plotted all of the zero records for Grafton, Casino, Kempsey and Dorigo and we've plotted what we call frost potential and again the blue bars represent 1959 to 1988 and the orange bars 1989 to 2018. The month is across the bottom of the chart and the number of frost days per week is up the side of the chart. It doesn't, uh, you'll notice of course that the frost days per week goes into portions of a day and, and that's not really um, anything to worry too much about because obviously they don't get frost every day but more, be more mindful of the pattern that we're showing here. So again anywhere that the blue bar is higher than the orange bar means that there are more frosts in the earlier period at that time of year on average than there were in, in the latter or most recent period. And anywhere that the orange bar is higher again that represents the more recent period having more frosts than the previous period. So there's a couple of interesting patterns you can see starting to emerge here. Grafton is showing that frosts through June, July and into starting into August um, have actually decreased in the last 30 years or have occurred less in the last 30 years. Um, August though shows that perhaps there's been more frosts occurring than the previous 30 years. There's also a bit of a pattern at Kempsey which is showing that frosts are starting to shift a bit later and there's more of them, particularly through June or uh, sorry, July, August and September. Also uh, June is, has shown a few more increases in frost. Um, but the, on the other hand, Dorigo is showing that there's been a decrease uh, in frost for, through autumn and, and winter. Uh, and a casino has also shown uh, a later shifting in frost. So you can see that there's a drop away in June and July, um, but that's picked up uh, more frosts in August and September. At the other end of the scale is the number of hot days. And you probably often hear us referring to average increases in temperature across Australia. We often talk about those average increases of being one to one and a half degrees and it's pretty hard to make meaningful sense of what that actually means for your business or your livelihood when it's such a small amount. So one way that we can show the impact of that average change is to present figures on the number of days above a particular threshold. So these charts are showing Grafton and Casino, the number of days above 35 degrees and Kempsey and Dorigo, the number of days over 30 degrees and it covers the last 60 or, 60 or 70 years. You can see in Grafton that certainly from the 1970s there's been a steady rise in the number of days per year that have been occurring above 35 degrees. Actually I can tell you that in 
between 1989 and 2018, um, Grafton experienced an average of 11 days per year above 35 degrees. And previous to that, between 1959 and 1988, Grafton experienced only five days on average per year above 35 degrees. You can see there's also a bit of a rise at Kempsey for the days over 30 degrees, but really since the 80s, that hasn't changed, so it's plateaued and remained stable. Same sort of thing for Casino. In fact, uh, it looks like there was a bit of a spike there in the 80s, but it's bounced around a little bit. There's certainly no consistent trend or incline uh, that we're seeing there. And Dorigo from the year 2000 uh, had a bit of a step up uh, and, and is starting to see um, more frequency of days over 30 degrees. But again, it's useful to have a look and see and just check um, the frequency of those and whether or not there's an increase in how many, in records as well. So you can see that even though Dorigo has had an increase in days above 30 degrees, it has had high numbers of days above 30 degrees in the past. The other thing we need to keep in mind here is that all of these weather stations have only been recording temperature since about the 1960s. So these ones don't go back 100 years like we have some of the other stations around the country. You can read more information about climate trends and projections and the information that I've presented today in a, pro in a report that we call the State of the Climate. It's a biennial report, so it comes out every two years. So the next report is due at the end of 2020. It's a collaboration between the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO, and it includes the latest monitoring science and projection information. It's available on our website. It's also available on the CSIRO website. There's also another website that I've linked to there, and that's called climatechangeinaustralia.gov.au. And that talks in more depth about some of the projections and the modelling that's being done for the future up to 2030 and 2050, and talks more about what might be happening across different regions around the country. Uh, so if you'd like to get some more information uh, based on what I've just shown you now, um, you can use those extra resources. Now there's time for questions. Uh, I will be now handing over to my colleague Alistair Hawksford, but thanks very much for the opportunity to present to you today. Well, thanks everyone. Um, this is Al Hawksford, um, and uh, I hope you uh, got a lot out of that presentation from Luke. Uh, I'd be happy to answer some questions now. So I think I'll start with um, uh, one that was raised by Lauren Wilson. Um, and so you were asking about whether the climate guides will be updated. Um, there's no plans to update the climate guides um, at this stage, but uh, we'd be very happy to um, uh, discuss ways that we could uh, start a project to do that. Um, uh, we're, we're here to uh, provide impact and value, so if we think that that would be a very valuable thing to do, um, there's certainly no restriction from exploring that idea. We had one other um, written down from Andrew Goulston here. Um, and it's asking about the uh, change in the reliability of data from weather stations. Um, the, the Bureau goes to great pains, as I'm sure you uh, uh, would appreciate, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, the data uh, that underpins all of our services is of the highest possible calibre. Uh, and so. Um, it's, I can certainly assure you that uh, the information that does underpin these services is uh, checked vigorously. <laughs> so those are the two that came uh, written in. Um, great, thanks for that. I've just noticed that uh, Rick Whitehead has asked about what the chance is for another drought similar to 2019. It's a great question, Rick, um, and it's one that's a challenging one to answer. Uh, the uh, the information that is provided on the uh, climate change in Australia website is is useful to understand the sort of direction that we're heading in, uh, as was the uh, um, climate guides information that Luke just walked us through. So we can get an idea about what the trend is for the region, uh, but unfortunately we can't look beyond uh, you know one year in advance. Um, 
uh, it even you know beyond six months is challenging. Um, but beyond one year, it's very hard for us to say uh, what the chance is. Um, what we do need to do is rely on the trend information, which does suggest that uh, the frequency of dry years is increasing. Um, so you know uh, we can't say exactly when they will be, but uh, it would be a good idea to prepare uh, businesses and uh, those businesses that uh, rely on farm business uh, be prepared for uh, a higher frequency of drought. So Om has asked about accessing data. Uh, so uh, via the Bureau's website there's um, a, a couple of different ways that you can access data. But uh, just for simplicity's sake, uh, please feel free to send an email to agriculture at bomb.gov.au and we'd be glad to help. Collins had an interesting question here about the utilisation of data from private weather stations. Um, uh, that's a uh, fantastic question, Colin. Uh, the Bureau uh, is absolutely looking at how we can utilise uh, let's call them non-bureau um, weather stations. And uh, we'll be, uh, uh, over the next two years, we have a project funded to um, find ways to uh, ingest and quality control the information that's coming in so that we can ensure that um, products and services uh, only utilise the highest quality information. Uh, because, of course, there is a risk that you know if we take in um, observations which uh, um, are a bit dodgy, <laughs> uh, then uh, we can end up uh, disrupting the products and services. So we're going to spend some concerted effort to make sure that that doesn't occur and we get the value out of those private weather stations. Thanks for that question. Kath has asked about um, uh, other ways to explain the rainfall forecast information. Uh, again, a great question and the Bureau is uh, actively working in this space to provide different ways to um, in, um, uh, present our rainfall forecasts. Uh, so uh, at this stage we're doing quite a lot of uh, listening to the needs of the uh, ag sector and um, uh, others within the community and other sectors to understand exactly uh, what would be understood and how their decision making can be improved with more tailored types of rainfall forecasts. So um, at this stage I'd encourage you to uh, um, uh, work with your local LLS members to uh, collate uh, ideas on what would be useful. You know, I, I talk about utopia <laughs> and um, uh, then we'll, we'll look to funnel them into the Bureau's um, uh, planning for future services. So great question. So the, the next one's from Bob Smith, which um, Alistair wasn't part of this previous um, webinar, so he's not familiar with the context. But um, the previous webinar, we had a, a consultant by the name of Simon Quilty who basically said that his historical data sort of always shown that after a, a drought, we tend to get two years of above average rainfall. I um, was just mm -hmm. wondering whether the Bureau actually had any comment on that and whether that's got any weight behind it. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so uh, what you've got there is what's known as a statistical forecast. Um, uh, so in other words, we can look at uh, what has happened in the past and try to infer what will happen in the future. Um, that's, uh, that was a fantastic uh, method uh, of forecasting, um, although uh, we've got the problem now that uh, climate change has, ch has uh, 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 started forcing the climate into a new state of being, which means that we, we are less able to rely on observations of the past to infer what will happen into the future. Um, so that's why there's been a significant investment in uh, supercomputing and uh, in uh, the modelling, uh, physics modelling, um, because they are proving to be a more effective 
uh, means of forecasting and statistical methods. So uh, I'm certainly not um, uh, uh, saying that Simon's wrong in any way. Like it, it could very well be that um, the, that's the case in history. I just uh, uh, add a bit of caution to acting on that information because we are in a new um, state of climate. Yeah, thanks for that one, Alistair. It was a bit of a hairy one. Um. I see Lauren has asked about um, uh, data from Dorigo uh, about going a couple of decades. Um, look, I, I'm afraid that I don't have a specific answer to why those uh, locations in particular uh, don't go back previous to that date. Uh, though I suspect it was just uh, that they weren't installed until um, uh, later than Kempsey, for example, which was installed uh, uh, you know, prior to the 1900s. So it, we do have to work with uh, the information that's at hand, um, and uh, sometimes it can just be uh, a bit limited based on the installation date. Alistair, with, with that one, I noticed that, especially around the North Coast, quite often and stations like Dorigo are part of that, is that um, while the majority of the data for most towns is collected at post offices, I know there's a lot of farm sort of observation stations around the place that probably have been used for past data, so we're just wondering whether they were considered for part of this presentation or was it just the GPO sort of ones? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, I come off a, uh, a farm outside of uh, Armadale where we've got yeah, 50 years of records um, uh, there, so I, I know what you mean. Um, I'll just go back to uh, the point that was made earlier about um, uh, the Bureau really does have to ensure that we use the uh, highest quality uh, information in our products and services. and so um, uh, To date, uh, there's been uh, very um, specific effort to uh, use uh, consistent methods of recording and quality control and uh, to, to ensure that we are uh, using the best possible data. So there isn't at this point a way to utilize those records that have been captured by um, you know, uh, generations past on the farm. Um, Though, look, I think that there could be an opportunity to do so in future, uh, but that being said, that's not something that has been explored in great detail. So again, if, if you think that that's an important um, uh, activity, please feel free to have a chat to your LLS representatives and we'll um, open a discussion. Richard um, had a question here about the accuracy of uh, forecasts, uh, particularly for rainfall forecasts. Uh, so um, uh, this is uh, always a really good topic, Richard, and uh, not one that uh, Luke uh, spent much time on here. Uh, so for the first seven days, uh, our forecasts uh, are, are really quite reliable. Um, uh, I believe, now Now we're going off the top of my head, so I'm um, uh, putting an asterisk next to these and I'd have to uh, go back and double check. But the maximum and minimum temperature forecasts uh, uh, for anywhere in the country are correct 90, 95 plus percent of the time. Um, the rainfall is a bit trickier, uh, so I believe uh, it's closer to the 90 percent of the time. Uh, that's out to seven days on average. And, but of course, you know, we need to take into account that some locations uh, are going to be more accurate than others, and at different times of the year will be more accurate than others. So I am just talking in terms of averages here. When we push out beyond seven days, uh, uh, we, we get into uh, that sort of probabilistic forecast that Luke was talking about in the outlooks. A really important piece of being able to utilise the information in those outlooks is by looking at the past accuracy maps. So uh, on the uh, Climate Outlooks viewer online, uh, you'll find past accuracy uh, right next to those outlooks. And they're uh, a map that's different shades of green. 
And that'll actually tell you very specifically how many times uh, that forecast has been correct in the past. So um, in this case for these outlooks in your region, I was just having a look before, there's um, the past accuracy uh, for the next uh, three months uh, is actually very good. It's north of 75%. So that means over the last, I believe it's 23 years, um, we've been correct more than 75% of the time for a forecast for July to September. So really quite reliable. Now I do um, ask that everyone ha familiarise themselves with those past accuracy maps because there are times at which uh, the Bureau has been uh, incorrect more often than it's been correct. And we're very open about that in these maps. So I'd suggest that if you um, aren't looking at these past accuracy maps, you can be at risk of using information that um, would be better to flip a coin, <laughs> just to, to put it in very um, straight terms. So please, please, please uh, familiarise yourself with the past accuracy maps. Andrew's asked about East Coast lows and the frequency of those events. I'm afraid I don't have anything at hand uh, on East Coast lows. Um, and I'm not familiar with any uh, recent research uh, in that space. So I I'm sorry that I don't have an answer for you, Andrew, but uh, an interesting question nonetheless. Om has asked about Evans Head um, uh, observations. Uh, so if you're interested in observations for any particular point, there is a, um, a, a um, part of the website, uh, I believe it's called Climate Data Online, where you can look at a map of all of the observation points um, and zoom in and out to uh, query uh, the data that's stored. Uh, so you can click on, uh, say, Evans Head and uh, it'll provide a histogram of the um, observations that have been recorded there. So I'd encourage you to have a look in, at that spot on. Stephen's asked about uh, predicting the possibility of floods and drier and wetter years. Uh, so Stephen, I think I'd refer you back to the climate guide uh, uh, for your region where um, uh, Luke talked about this uh, briefly in the, in the slides where uh, it does appear that uh, the frequency of wet years uh, has remained stable. Uh, though the frequency of dry years is increasing. Uh, so that is probably about as much as I can provide as a, at a local scale. Otherwise I'd suggest having a look at uh, the um, other link which was provided for the state of the climate. And that'll uh, show at a bit of a broader scale, more national, um, where those sorts of things, uh, that information is stored. So it looks like we're starting to wind down in the rate of <laughs> questions <laughs> popping up. I hope I've kept up and answered it, everyone's. Um, um, Julie, do you, did you think we have time for any more questions at this point? Yes, sorry, um, Alistair, yeah, I was saying yes, we do need to wrap this up soon. But yeah, there was Kirsten's question, which was, um, it might be just a misunderstanding of um, the data. Um, so you're saying that the data you have to date doesn't show a significant change in climate over recent years. I suspect that was probably the two 30-year blocks and the, the um, fact that we don't have a lot long-term data for rainfall for Grafton and Dorigo. Right, gotcha. So uh, yeah, thanks Kirsten. So um, I'd say that there, there has been changes. Uh, if you have a look at the climate guide, um, it's a, it, it is a useful resource. It, when, what we were talking about where it says that there's been a stable rainfall, that's when you're looking at um, annual averages. Um, when you actually look at, okay, what's the frequency of a wet year or a frequency of a dry year, so that's those years which are um, in the top uh, third of rainfall or those years which are in the bottom third of rainfall, you start to see some trends emerging, which does suggest um, that uh, while there's not much change in the wetter years, 
There's a reduction in the average years and an increase in the dry years. And similarly, uh, the frost um, uh, periods have changed. Uh, so we've got frosts occurring later in the season for all locations and Dorigo receiving less frosts. So, um, uh, oh, and of course there was the hot days where uh, Grafton and Dorigo are receiving more days above 35 degrees. So there's, um, there's quite a few changes which have been observed um, and um, uh, I think would be worth reflecting on how they might impact uh, businesses in the region. I hope that helps. So I think we'll take um, Lauren's question as the last one today. Um, if anybody else has any other burning questions, please put them in the chat box because um, we will be collecting these questions later and we have um, an ability to ask Luke and Alistair via email for some answers that we can provide later. So we'll just do Lauren's now um, and then I'll pop my email in the box if anybody wants to send me some questions after we've closed the webinar. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Lucky last. Um, so you, you've asked about how often the uh, seasonal outlooks are updated. Um, so they are updated uh, every fortnight at the minute, I believe, uh, and we are moving to weekly updates. Uh, and it may have even already occurred. So um, it's at least every fortnight. Um, and so uh, it's, it is worth keeping an eye on those um, uh, outlooks uh, if there's something particularly happening in, within the next month. Because, for example, we do have those weekly and fortnightly um, uh, outlooks now on the website, so it's not just the three months. You can look at uh, you know, the week following this one, the fortnight following that, uh, the individual months after that. So uh, I'd suggest having a bit of an explore around the uh, Climate Outlooks link which was provided um, today and um, uh, see what you can find. So thanks everyone for your time and your questions. Um, uh, again, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to uh, uh, reach out to your uh, LLS members uh, for any further questions or ideas. Uh, we're very happy to work together to um, uh, explore those. Uh, and of course, if you wanted to come straight to the Bureau, feel free to reach out at agriculture at bomb.gov.au. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I um, hope you found it interesting. And um, yeah, stay, stay in the loop for further webinars with us. So thank you very much.